working in documentary, there's that real joy of other people and real things going on in the world that you don't have to create and that that's when things are also just a lot more inspiring. There's a lot of life I just think we're sort of half living. Images, information bounce off you. I think when you come across work that just jolts you a little bit or appeals to your imagination, then that's when something communicates something much deeper and is the type of work I'm drawn to. My name's Chloe Dew Matthews, I'm a photographer. We're in London, in Hammersmith, just by the Thames. Or well, not in Hammersmith, actually, in Barnes, just over the river. This is my family home. I've lived here since I was born. And this is currently where I have my studio and where I'm living. Well, I think I've always been creative and made things, which led then to going to art school and then went to Oxford, where I did a fine art BA um, at the Ruskin. And there I was doing conceptual sculpture. From doing that, then I went on to working in film, films like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Breaking and Entering, which was Anthony Minghella's last film. And although it was a really exciting thing to get into, I just didn't really feel like I was being very creative personally. So after about four years, I decided to stop doing that. And documentary photography really was my way of sort of looking outward and engaging with the world and then making something with that. Having done fine art at university, it feels like it really gave me a sort of critical awareness that taught me more how to think than anything else, rather than a sort of aesthetic or a sort of a technique. But at the same time, it has its own baggage. When I was doing more of the sort of fine art, conceptual sculpture, I think I, I worried so much about, you know, is this the right thing to be doing and in the context of that and so it is quite nice to come in to photography or do documentary photography without any of that baggage. I'm sort of not educated in it so I think that I do feel quite free about the way I work. I don't, I don't worry too much about it and I think I'm much more trusting of my, of my instincts now. While I was assisting I'd found out that there were communities of Hasidic Jews that came from all over the country and they go on holiday in Aberystwyth, which is coastal Wales, um, every summer for two, two weeks of the year. Aberystwyth is like Brighton, you know, it's a sort of Victorian promenade where people go for their holidays and go and paddle in the water and go and have ice creams and fish and chips and everything. And to see these, you know, long, elegant black figures wandering up and down the promenade, it was sort of like looking back towards the sort of Victorian times, especially because when you think about the sort of family model and the way in which families interact, it is it feels like it is quite old fashioned in comparison to the way a lot of people live in sort of contemporary urban life. I think sometimes there is, you know, this curiosity about people who have very particular lifestyles. For me, part of what was really important to communicate was, was just that sense of holiday and family rather than trying to find some sort of idiosyncrasy that would be entertaining someone else. Well, I feel definitely an interest in both at home and abroad sort of cultural mixes. I find it really fascinating and of course symptomatic of contemporary life and you know a globalized world. I think that's also just part of being a Londoner you know just being so absolutely saturated with cultures from all over the world you know it's just part of it's part of who we are and it's part of what I look for when I'm overseas or here really. Yeah we're in Shoebury Ness which is the north bank of the Thames, the mouth of the river. I've just come on a little exploratory wander around, really. The Thames is a long, long-term project that's an overarching theme that brings together a lot of different stories along the Thames, so from mouth to source, but alongside the smaller stories that focus in on people's activities or people's lives along the Thames, then also I'm just shooting landscapes and details that sort of give context to those stories. We're in um, 
south end at the big amusements. I think it's called, they're either called Fantasy Islands or Adventure Islands normally. <laughs> I, there's so much stuff that's done in Britain about the seaside and sort of quintessential British holidays that I think probably this won't work for the Thames project, but it is, it probably is the main sort of holiday resort on the Thames, so it's definitely worth having a look and you never know, I might find something that's worth incorporating in somewhere. Michelle, Chantel and Shelley are all types of what? A. Bicycles, B. Scrubbing brushes or C. Garden squirrels. No. For me, photographing is a way to discover a place as well as a job. So being on the Thames and just wandering along and giving yourself time to discover and explore really is exciting because you just find all these things that you hadn't known about so close to you know where you live. Is there any chance you mind if I take a picture out to see while you're in the foreground? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think many people consider the Thames as a sort of defunct waterway that used to be the sort of industrial passageway and exit to the rest of the world. And famously, I mean, it's just steeped in history. And yet, nowadays, even in London, it feels like it's little glanced at, you know, that people are just rushing, beetling across the bridges and not really even noticing this great rush of natural thrust below them. Well, these two people have just come up to me and they saw me photographing and said, oh, would you mind, we're just going to pray here, would you mind if we just spent a moment? And I said, no, of course not. Would you mind if I photographed you? And they said, no, of course not. <laughs> sort of <laughs> dream situation. <laughs> what I'm looking for on this Thames piece, it's the ways in which people are reclaiming the, the water and the Thames as something that they use in their everyday lives. In 2010, I did a nine-month journey with my boyfriend from China back to Britain overland. And we were hitchhiking and camping the whole way just as a way of really physically experiencing that transition from east to west, from Asia to Europe. During that time, I shot a piece called China's Wild West, which was in Xinjiang, the western province of, of China which is the Uyghur Autonomous Zone. They're now a minority, but they were a majority of um, Uyghur Muslims living in this part of Western China. They believe they're indigenous to that area, but the Han Chinese government are essentially pushing them out. It's a very resource-rich area. The Uyghur minority are being sent to work in other areas because they're sort of trying to dilute their population, their culture, their language, their traditions, everything. And so it was a piece that, in a sense, I stumbled across. I, I was aware of the situation going on because there had been riots in 2009 where there was a lot of bloodshed and a lot of information in the news, the international media about it. And so, but you know, as is so often the way, things go quiet. So when we went through, it was probably nine months later. And I think what was really clear to me was that there was this sense of violence, there was this sense of tension sort of everywhere you looked and I think that's what I wanted to try and portray was the sort of everyday lives of people who are constantly watching their backs. For example we met a family um, on a train who were going to visit their son who was in prison. He'd been in there for three years and he had a 15 year sentence because he was selling Islamic DVDs in the marketplace. I mean there was just all sorts of little things that were happening, small stories, you know, things that you just hear a rumour of. And I suppose in, in this series of work I was just trying to get across that sort of latent aggression that I felt there and what happens after a more significant conflict or a sort of significant um, happening that then is much less talked about in the media. So... This one is from um, the Aral Sea out in the Cockerell Dam, right out in the desert where there is just this one place where the dam has been built, meaning that people, fishermen, can come from all around the area to, to fish again. This is from um, the series of migrant workers who are camping 
um, in the cemetery grounds in Kazakhstan. So they're living in these sorts of cabins for about four months of the year and then constructing these huge mausolea for the new or rich middle class. These are some of the engravings that you'll see on the, on the mausolea. I think I found that area, particularly the Caspian region, very interesting, partly because it was such a mix of cultures and influences and it had this history of you know, the Ottomans going through, the Mongols, the, well, the Soviets, um, Genghis Khan. But it really felt like now it's changing, certainly because of the global oil industry, but also these new countries, you know, they've only been formed for, for 20 years. So seeing how, how they're defining themselves. And I think there's something, the, the lure of the sea, you know, there's something when you stand on the shore and you look out to sea, there is something very powerful about that. And I suppose for me, looking out and thinking of this potency underneath all this sort of these resources, that um, there was a sort of magic there and there was an atmosphere and there was something that now con continues to draw me back. So this is a trail of oil leading to the Naftalan sanatorium where people bathe in crude oil as a health remedy in Azerbaijan. Um, I've got some small prints here that you can see people bathe for about 10 minutes in the crude oil. These were shot in quite a short period of time and so I'm really keen to go back and to do more with individual people. I think that there's also a real change in that area and because there is this new wealth and new appetite for the more sort of leisure activities, there's all these big developments in Naftalan, which is the oil spa town. I suppose coming from a sculpture background, there's that real interest in materials and coming to something like this where it's so seductive, that oil, both repulsive and delightful, you know. Yeah, it was really overwhelming seeing this time coming back to Baku, how much the architecture has changed. And there's now a series of monuments to the oil and gas industries. So these are recently built um, luxury flats and big hotel, and everyone calls them the flame towers. So there's three towers in the shape of flames, and they've been made in the last year, I think. They're almost completed now. It's just interesting seeing such literal um, representation of the oil and gas industry in the town and it is being pushed so so strongly as the identity of new um, Azerbaijan and Caspian countries. Yeah so we're back in the sanatorium where I shot two years ago last time I came here um, I was just camping in a sort of scrubby bit down there, but this time I organised beforehand with the director to come back and stay um, in the sanatorium. In the 19th century, here was a shulkery put. A shulkery put was a shulkery put. Well, we were one. Then we knew that Naftalan, the skin of the skin, was very good. We had a shulkery put. Вот это верблюда попал на фтолановый вот яма. Потом хозяин обратно пришел, посмотрел, что вот это верблюда здоровее, чем остальные. После этого начали интересоваться тогда. Процедура выдается 10 минут. Температура в нафталине должна быть 37-38 градусов, не выше. Курс лечения у нас 14 дней, 15 дней. Есть некоторые заболевания, которые нигде не лечатся. Например, кожаный, э, псориаз. Вот это только лечит в мире нафталан. Одновременно у нас обязательно требуется физиотерапия, массаж, парафин и те и другие лечения. А вы знаете, что... На нас только люди приезжали, но через 10 дней они лучше бегают тут, чем мы. 
Вот нафталан, действительно есть нафталан, который Бог нам создал это. Да. Да. And that is a chemical that is refined and used in sort of skin products, for example. It's certainly a regulated treatment. It's not like you just turn up and just ask for a bottle or a bath. So people are prescribed, you know, 10 days bathing once a day. From people from Baku are given this prescription and they come and they spend this time relaxing and then they do a bit of physiotherapy and a bit of massage and various things. And it's very much a accepted normal thing to do. It's in the communal mentality of okay it's summertime, go off to a sanatorium and go and relax. Yeah we've just been invited in to um, have a look at this treatment. I think it's um, some sort of um, actually I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm sure I saw something like physiotherapy but we're just going along with it for the moment because I think it's quite we're feeling quite lucky if we've been granted any access to just go along with it and find out afterwards really. I'm led to believe that it does have some of the same chemicals that are used in conventional medicines for rheumatism, arthritis. So I think it makes sense that it, it has restorative qualities, but I think that the idea is probably that it should be refined before it's used, whereas they're just using it unrefined. And so Western experts say that it could be carcinogenic, but you know, no one's mentioned that here. And there are pros and cons to being a female working within the art and um, photography worlds, you know, and I think that, like with everything in life, hopefully you use what you have to your advantage. So I think that I quite like being in the minority. There is a patient. His head aches. Okay. You know, I just look like a young girl and sometimes probably people think I'm just a student or something. So I think that does make you much less threatening. I like to just wander around and chat away and not be too clearly sort of photographer with lens in your face and then just quietly take pictures when something interesting happens. And sometimes then you get more involved with various people, um, which can lead to a different type of, of photo. Нафталан уникальный нефть, равному которому нет во всем мире по своему лечебному свойству. Нафталан свое развитие получила в 30-35 году. В Нафталане построили первую санаторию. В годы советской власти в Нафталане построили шесть санаторий. В этих санаториях ежегодно отдыхало около 70-80 тысяч человек. В этих санаториях в настоящее время отдыхают 5-6 тысяч человек. So these are crutches of people who have been healed um, by taking the Natalan oil baths. And they've been in the um, museum, but the museum was recently burnt. And so they've just been brought along here so we can photograph them. We're about to go to one of the newest sanatoriums, which is really luxurious, and everyone in the town keeps telling us, oh, it's the finest quality, all European standards and everything. It's changed substantially in that a lot of money has been put into infrastructure, all the roads are different, there's lighting all the way down, there's sort of promenades. But certainly Azerbaijan is Europe looking and it's all these luxury hotels and spas and everything, they keep saying, oh, it's to European standards. And it's also, you know, just embracing capitalism and these two really large and luxurious hotels are paving the way for the future and really defining the area in the way it wants to be defined. There's a lot of discussion that came out in recent years saying, oh, it's 20 years after um, the Soviet Union collapsed and how will these new republics define themselves? And to see that so clearly, them defining themselves in terms of oil, the resource, and, you know, that, that they were proudly saying, this is, this is who we are, I found that um, quite striking. <laughs> so. 
I'm always looking for small stories that are representative of larger issues because I think that's the only way that I know best to communicate something and that's what communicates best to me. Here you just can't get away from oil, like oil and gas here and also in Kazakhstan. It just feels like even if you try and find a subject elsewhere, you keep getting drawn back to it because it is the sort of lifeblood of the new country. Here people believing in it fully for its sort of holistic, healthy, healing, therapeutic qualities when we associate it with heavy industry, power, politics, corruption. But it was just an idea that sort of slightly shifts your, your perception or your, your ideas beforehand. Well here people are very proud of their resource rich land and the fact that they've now got it back. You know, it's theirs to use as they wish. I'm sure it will continue to, money will be injected into these big cities and showpiece tourist zones, but the question is obviously whether that filters out past the places that they want the tourists to go. I suppose as a foreigner you're drawn to things if you do go abroad that are different to what you know already, and so seeing it becoming more similar to what I know is perhaps less appealing, but at the same time it's wonderful if it means that people are doing what they want to do and, you know, able to have jobs and enjoy all the things that other people in the world enjoy, then that's really important. But it would be nice to strike some sort of balance where two things could exist, you know.